Welcome to the Silver Lined Relaunch. And today I have my dear friend, AC Green. That's right, my power Laker that when I was growing up in LA, I went to so many of the Laker games. He was part of the Magic Johnson, Worthy, Kareem. He was part of that group. I mean, it was really the celebrity of the celebrities in basketball. And today I am actually going to talk to him about, you name it, nothing is off limits. We go into detail about the basketball seasons, we go into mindset, we go into making sure that you've crafted what you think your legacy and things in the future are gonna be. Super fun for me since I have known AC for almost 10 years. So awesome to have him on the show today. So let's jump in and let's start the conversation. You're listening to the Silver Lined Relaunch, and I'm your host, Hilary DeCesar, award-winning entrepreneur and transitional coach. Each week, I'll invite you to tune into inspirational stories, revealing how you too can turn ordinary experiences into the extraordinary. Feeling stuck? I'll share step-by-step -step strategies to fuel your ability to experience a life where silver linings are both abundant and possible. Well, welcome everyone to the Silver Lined Relaunch. And today is such a special day for me because I have my dear friend, AC Green, on with us and it is going to be a very interesting conversation because when I first had this opportunity to meet AC and I'm wondering AC if you even remember this but first and foremost welcome to the show thank you thank you so much Hillary I appreciate it I'm honored and it is so good to get onto this particular podcast with you. And it is, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. I really am. I've been excited about it since your invitation. So thank you. Well, you're so terrific. And again, do you remember when we met? Do you remember how we met? Tell me. Okay. Tell me. <laughs> well, actually we've known each other now for upwards of, I think it's like eight, maybe 10 years. So we've known each yeah. other a really long time. And you've been over to my house and we've had dinners together and my kids right, absolutely true. adore you. But, me, we, but we met at the Boys and Girls Club. You were the MC and I was one of the judges and we were judging or we were actually going to be awarding the Youth of, youth the, of year. the Year. Yep. And that's when I met you. And it was, I, I remember when I heard you were going to be the MC, it just sent like, I had chills going down like everywhere because I grew up in Los Angeles during your heyday. I mean, I was, I was in the audience. I cannot tell you how many times just loving the Lakers up. I mean, between you and Magic and Kareem, and I'm trying to think of who else was on the team. Um, we, well, By Byron Scott. Yeah. And, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Michael Cooper. Yeah. And um, and uh, Worthy. Big, big Game James Worthy. Yes. Okay. See? I you still mean, I'm That's telling right. you, I had my gear. I had like, I, every time. <laughs> I only had one outfit, so I would wear that same outfit every single time. That's all you needed. That's all I needed. That's all I needed. And, I'm, just, hey. and when you guys did the three-peat, I mean, <laughs> you would have thought I was, you know, one of your one of your, your dancers on the floor. I was doing everything I could. It was so my fun. But we became, we became good friends. And throughout the years, there's definitely been the ups and the downs and the silver linings that do come with life. But I would love to talk to you about your experience being an NBA player, about having those times where you you have the highs and you have the lows. Can we go we can we go into a little bit of that? Sure, absolutely. Let's do it. 
So when you first started and you were on your way to the playoffs the first time, what was, I mean, when you, you, you can't win all the time, right? And even though I know that you were the most consecutive regular season game player ever, I think you still hold the record, right? That's true. I do. Okay. Okay. I mean, I think consecutive, you went 1,192 games. I mean, we're talking yeah. like, you know, integrity to the max. You say you're going to be there. You're going to be there. Um, but what happens when you build something up in your mind? How do you, how do you handle that? How do you get into the mindset of, one, I'm going to always be there. And two, what happens when things don't go the way you want? Well, Hillary, it's a great question. It really is. And I can reflect back on my first, my, which is obviously my rookie year. And I joined the Laker team um, as world champions. Okay. We had just won beating the Boston Celtics, our nemesis. And it was like, it was a, a hump that so many of the guys finally had a breakthrough. Even Jerry West was like, finally, we got over this, this, this Celtic hate nostalgia. And like, it happened. We beat them, we beat them, we beat them kind of thing. And I just remember now I come into the, t into the team. And so now that next year, my rookie year, and all the thing I hear was the expectation of repeating. Now we're going to do it again. Okay, we got them. Now we're the champs. And now we're going through our champion year. And, and we were good. We were good. I mean, we played like champs uh, in our division, uh, in our conference. And I just remember going into the playoffs and we were, you know, just battling one of our uh, divisional foes. And we got to our event, winning the first round, second round, uh, and then getting to our conference finals. And we played, we were playing the Houston Rockets, which started to play a little bit over their head based in the regular season and then how they played in the playoffs. And then we got to the point of the final game and we wind up losing on a last second shot that a player by the name of Ralph Sampson had put up with the, literally, I mean, one point, like maybe three seconds on the clock kind of thing. And barely saw the rim behind the head flip kind of shot. And it just at home in the forum, the place you visited so many times, oh, crushing. it was just that it was devastating because all the expectations and everyone's like, Oh, we're going to do it again. We're going to repeat. And we're now in the conference. We're one step away. We're in the conference finals and it's onto the finals and we're going to win this thing. And then that shot, goes mm -hmm. in it rolls around the rim and around the rim <sighs> and it and like the, the the ball stays up there forever the, the shot clock and the the game clock just seems like it just ticks in slow motion and they both just like come down at the end and it just so yes that the devastation of that um i i learned now mind you i learned a whole heck of a lot by watching my teammates because I've only I only saw them the preparation, the expectation, mm -hmm. the focus, the dedication. Pat Riley, our head coach, Jerry West, our GM, and so I, I saw this mindset. You know what it took to be a champion, and then when it didn't happen, I that's when page one of the learning lesson started. Oh my gosh! And those you know those moments where that ball is going around the rim. <laughs> And it does seem like the clock, you know, the clock is on slow motion. Yeah. Everyone's just like, it's the longest, you know, <laughs> nanosecond in the world, right? Yeah. Yes, exactly. So it, so it the ball goes in yes. and you are almost in a state of shock, right? Yes. Because you're absolutely at this point thinking, we got this, we got this, we got this. And then this crazy, you know, crazy one goes in. What did, what'd you first think? Like what was going through your head? You know, it, it's, it reminded me of how not one, I'm not a parent, but I know and I see how my nieces and nephews look at me or look at their parents in certain situations where they just sort of look and they're like, 
<laughs> what next kind of moment? What do I do? I'm watching to see what you're going to do to know how I should act. And it was one of those that I, I'm now just, I'm watching all my veterans. And well, and I'm, then the audience, the, the people that are, you know, sitting there, the spectators uh, are all watching you. I yes, mean, they want to see yes. how you're going to react. I mean, yes. You're watching them. They're watching you. Yes. Yes. It's one, it's one of those, it's one of those kind of moments. And so we, you know, basically we like, can you believe that? And, and it was all of maybe three or four words in a sentence th that exchange between you know, us players, as we're now head down, walking off the court into our locker room, into total silence. Like, I can't, we're, we can't believe we knew we were coming in here, but we didn't expect to come in here as losers. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was just a, a gnarly, uh, life-changing moment. So who was inspiring in that room? The good thing is this, okay? I had guys who have been through wars before. They've been through battles. They were battle tested. And none of them were perfect. They, they had some scars that they came into that contest with. And so uh, Jerry West was one who was constantly like a voice for reason. Pat Riley mm -hmm. was a, 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 steady, a steady ship. You know, mm -hmm. like, look, we didn't, we did not meet our our goal. Our goal was to get to the finals and win the championship again. You know, Magic Johnsons, the players I mentioned, the Byron Scotts and James Worthy, and the Kareem Abdul Jabbar's, all these guys, remember, had just experienced the jubilation <laughs> of the year before, and now it's the the ashes of defeat and that agony that happens, and so it, it, they were able to balance it out. They were. It took it. It took. Uh, it took some time. It wasn't like that night, but they were able to balance it out and, and keep it in perspective and and really keep moving forward. Because the takeaway that we initially said that we had about two days before we had our what we call our our um, our final meeting before players go out into the summer from their teams, and our and that final two days later we came together as a team and we're like, guys. We obviously we didn't get it done, but let's go. Away. Let's commit to go away into the summer and be better when we come back. And that was our takeaway. And then was it the next season that you guys won, or was it the season after? Well, ironically, the next two seasons we actually won championships. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah so. I, I, I I can't remember the year you first said, so I'm listening and I'm like, oh. Remember that. So, so you came back after that, and it was, it was just all in. You're now. This is you. You've got that winning streak, and then you won again, and then you you end up leaving the Lakers. You go off. You have other you know teams that you play for, and when you retired. Can you give us a little insight into how you were? Because that's a major relaunch in itself, right? Your identity mm -hmm. was this basketball player, famous basketball player, successful basketball player. What happened to you when the career was, you decided, I, I, I'm i done now. What happened? It's, it's, it was a nice setup. Okay, basketball provided a ton of opportunities, uh, responsibilities, um, just uh, humanitarian commitments that that afforded me the, the luxury to be able to be a part of a lot of great things, and 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 a lot of that dealt with the idea of the next, the future, the next step, the next generation, and what happened, I think, like you mentioned, as I Went through, I went into free agency after we won championships and things like that in the late 80s. And I went into free agency and I went away from the whole Laker organization from a player standpoint, always still, all the friends and relationships are always still there. But part of that whole silver lining was the fact that 12 years later, I come back to the Laker team. And they, at that time, was a team full with great 
individual players, superstar type players, um, but never found a, never was able to put it together. You know, never were able to like strike and meet that potential. And I say that to say that year I came back was the Shaquille O'Neal, the Kobe mm-hmm. Bryant's, mm-hmm. Um, the Derek Fishers, uh, all these Rick Foxes, all these guys were uh, Robert Ory. These guys are now on the team. And, and now Phil Jackson and I, uh, we come along with a couple other veterans. And so it's just amazing that now the roles have changed. So now who do they look to to be that voice of reason? That voice of how do you handle success? How do you become successful? And how do you remain successful? And so you got Phil Jackson as a coach, and you have myself, another player named John Sally, and Ron Harper, guys who had won championships. Robert Ory even had won championships at that time. But it's just funny how now I became the elder statesman. Mm-hmm. And so I'm now that, that voice in that locker room. And that just, and I wind up retiring basically after we won a championship that year. Okay. Uh, now I'm in the Staples Center. I, oh my gosh! So <laughs> was that was that 2000? 2000, yeah, yeah. 2000, this. and you won, yeah. and then you retired. Yes, yes. Oh, I love it, that. Yes, it how it just it comes at all the whole silver lining. It just it comes back, and it came back around, and it just presented a a, a platter. Okay, of an opportunity just like right. that with a bunch of guys who, you know, trying to find themselves, find their identity mm-hmm. inside that particular league. And what happened in the interim off the court was really the chance to really define some opportunities that I've always wanted to do. And that is continue to work the passion, working with the youth. And that's where I, in that interim in the 1990, I founded the AC Green Youth Foundation. And it's now 30 plus years later. and it just constantly has grown and developed. And, and then there's the different things inside the business world and business sector. And it's just been a lot, a lot of fun. But like I said, it was just a perfect setup to go through some of those experiences. And I'm grateful. Well, and for those that don't know about the AC Green Youth Foundation, you set that up for kids to really help build their self-esteem and confidence. And yes. you, you do that. It's it's really a huge part of you, your character, and your identity is, you know, morals and ethical principles, and you know, making those responsible decisions. So your foundation, although you know it's it's really primarily focused in the the sports, it's teaching all of what you've just explained. It's yeah. when you when you come into this where you're young and you're youthful and you're trying to you know understand and garner how do I handle this situation, and then you finally end up being the person to handle the situation. It's almost like this has come full term for you. Yes, it really, really has. So it has, and I'm and like I said, I'm grateful. I, it's not one of those Hollywood scripts that I could have wrote for myself. Mm. Okay, it's only life could have brought these these expectations and journeys and opportunities along the along the way. And it's, it's been a lot of fun. But so now, you know, you have a chance and there's working with our, our, our kids and doing esports. You know, basically the concept has always been, let's, what are the kids interested in? What, what do our youth want to do? You know, what career paths are they, do they have? We were, like you said, we worked on the, the whole Youth of the Year for the Boys and Girls Club of America. Okay, and that work still continues to this particular day. But where are the kids' passions? And now let's find opportunities that can interject and intertwine in between those particular passions. So here comes esports, because why? Kids love gaming. Mm-hmm. They love playing games and they're always, you know, on that smartphone, this, that, and the other. Well, I developed one of the uh, e- an esports opportunity. I won't say develop, I have an esports opportunity that's a part of the same foundation, okay, that allows kids to be able to play sports, okay, on, the, on their little. Whatever it is, whatever for the Fortnite, mm-hmm. the Call of Duties, whatever it might be, but also there's an educational sector attached to that. And so, are the, but are the kids really going to want to go off of the Fortnite and go into an educational component? Like you, like, Hillary, the amazing thing is this: you have to teach them that there is an educational component to it. So it's more of a mindset change. That's what's mm-hmm. like a skills. It's a skills based. Okay, opportunity. So that's why now educational places such as our school districts, they want this 
these esports to come in because now hand eye coordination, I creative thinking it. ability, absolutely, you know, the co cognitive reasoning, teamwork, and how to play together. I mean, all these things just you setting a pattern and, a, and creating a paradigm shift, and it's been amazing, amazing how that has happened. And so I'm I'm also very grateful for that too. Well, and you and I were, um, you know, one of the companies I've worked with or ran in the past was Everloop. And we talked about this yep. connection of how do you make education fun? And usually people are like, wait a second, if they're gaming, they're not going to want educational side of it. But as you said, if you can change the mindset to all of a sudden have them level up, have it be a gaming experience, have them want to compete from an educational perspective where they're mm -hmm. getting points to do things. They do it. The kids start to do it. And more importantly, as your entire, you know, underlying foundation is all about, they build their self-esteem. Yes. They, they no longer think, you know, I'm dumb. I can't do this. And they really start to feel like, you know what, gee, I, I'm really good at this. And once, right. you, once you get a kid to be good at one thing, yep. then it's like, oh, I love yeah. that. So I want to, I want to ask you, I, um, I work with a lot of people that are in their midlife, right? We're trying okay. to figure out like, what's next? What do I mm -hmm. do? You know, what, what is also out there? And I do find athletes, especially with, or it could even be, you know, a CEO of a company, you get so caught up in your identity that sometimes it's super hard to move away from what you've known and been all your life, right? As a mm -hmm. kid, you probably are like, I want to play basketball. I want to play basketball. Mm -hmm. And then you get to play basketball and it's so intense in the experience. How do you then go when you retire after, you know, this, this huge season season and you become, you know, the, the champions and you decide, all right, it's time. How do you then get back to who you really are? Your, you know, who is AC green at that point? So, and it's a great, great question. It is, Hillary. And I think the answer to that is, you know, you have to, if you don't plan to succeed, you plan to fail, you know? And so you have to plan to succeed and plan for success today so you can experience it tomorrow. And so I started to do those things that I would consider something I wanted to do post-basketball during basketball. And so I remember talking to, let's go back, to those veteran guys on that championship Laker air team, okay, in this quote unquote showtime era. And I remember being on the bus and I'm talking to Michael Cooper, Byron Scott, uh, Magic, and uh, James, Mitch Kupchak. And I remember Michael Thompson. And, and I'm asking, I say, what, so what make, um, what are you going to do after this? You know, what's the plan, guys? What's like, how long do you want to play? And, and months, remember, I'm the young guy coming in. So I'm like, you know, what's good? What's good? They said, Ace, look, if you can get 10 years out of this league, you've, did, you've done great. If you, but then, then what are you going to do? And then, and, I'm, and so I'm like listening, I'm listening. And I'm like, well, well so, so, well, what are you guys going to do? What, you, know, so <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> you figure it out so that I can just follow behind you. I want yeah, the draft. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm like, okay, so what are you guys going to do? So Magic, like, I, I want to be a businessman. I want to go into, mm -hmm. I want to go into business. And Byron's like, Byron and Coop both said, uh, Byron said, I want to, I want to do coaching. He says, I can see myself doing a coach and uh, do coaching. Cause he said, I like, I like the X's and O's and I understand. And I, and I, that's part of what I see myself doing. Case in point. Um, Michael Cooper says, yeah, me too. He says, but actually, I want to coach in the women's basketball. I want to see women get a chance to play basketball. I said, that's something I, I always dreamed of being able to do. And so Michael Thompson, Clay Thompson's father, says, I want to, he says, I'm going to be the prime minister of the Bahamas. So I'm going back <laughs> to my home country. So we had to have one, okay? We had to. <laughs> but, but rest assured, the guys basically, they had a plan. They mm -hmm. had something out there. And sometimes you might fall a little bit short of what that goal might be, but you got to have something you're aiming toward. And so for me, it was, like I said, in the 90s, now mind you, I had just played four years and then I started the foundation that went on another, then I played another uh, 10 years. 
Okay. And so it was one of those things that it developed over time as I was playing. And so when I finished, I sort of, it was easy to segue right into what my passion really, really was and what, what really uh, carried me throughout all of that. And, and even in basketball was the fact that um, it was, it was the loss of my father. Um, because as, as, uh, traumatic as you can imagine that being in 2007, taking place in the middle of me teaching one of my basketball camps, I mean, you know, we, I it's a, always teach a week long camp, eight to five typically. And, and so my dad, uh, he passes on Wednesday morning while I was at camp, I, mm-hmm. I, I got the phone call. Okay, and I happen to be in Portland, which is where my, my dad, my parents, my whole family is really basically at. So I just saw him that morning. And then this happens, you know, hours later, I get the phone call. And it's one of those things that now you have, you, what do you do? You have that memory, okay? You have that drive and determination because this is what and who he was. And he taught me hard work. He taught me commitment. He taught me dedication. When when he wanted, when he said we as a family was going somewhere, we went right. We we got there and we got there early. Okay, <laughs> and so he has certain certain life lessons that he just instilled inside of all of us, and especially me being the youngest in the family. And so I say all that to say the things from basketball even to the foundation to this day, it it all have been birthed and inspired by him. And just what he transfused inside of me uh, as a as a father to a son. Well, it sounds like when you said earlier you don't plan to succeed, you know, then you're planning to fail. That that was ingrained in you since you were little. I mean, yeah, that was just kind of. And I love the idea that throughout those years you were already starting to think about, you know, what it what really is the, you know, my calling, what's my purpose, what, what's going to, what's going to keep me going. And you ended up creating the AC Green Youth Foundation, you know, years before you ended up really dedicating so much of your time. Now, when your dad, when your dad passed, Mm -hmm. um, having just lost my mom, I just, it, you never can, you never can be in a position where it's like, you know, oh, okay, it happened. You're, you're, you're always surprised. You're always taken by it. It just, Mm -hmm. it's not, it's never easy. It's, it's something. How did you now, since that was 2007, when you look back, is there a silver lining of having a parent pass? You know, I honestly, I, I would say it is because obviously it depends on the relationship you have with the parent. Mm-hmm. Okay. But for someone, I'm sure like as you and I've talked, you know, off, off podcasts of how significant your relationship and your the role your mom played in your life. And I can say very in a similar way that the role my dad has played in, in my life. So the, I don't know if I would have seen or, had the perspective uh or even maybe even that same drive um if he if he hadn't because it's something um it just it it drives it home it drives it deeper now that i can't make that phone call Mm, so true yeah. yeah well you know one thing that i've recently been thinking is um you know until you and I, I feel a lot of times, um, you know, guys with their dads or girls with their moms, and it can be the same for the opposite, of course. Mm-hmm. But given that it's your dad and my mom, I'm going to use this example. Right. Um, when my mom passed, and now I can see the silver lining is that, you know, we've all, we always talk about grown ups, mm-hmm. and you know, you don't really like. What does that really, really mean? And then I finally realized when my mom passed that it gave me a chance to grow up yeah, like upwards and be rooted, not just in and find source and find the universe and find the calling in God and all that, you know, whatever you believe, but there was this amazing where I was so connected to her for my answers 
I was like you said, the phone call, like, you know, I'll just, yeah. okay, just call and hey, what should I do? What should I do? And now all of a sudden it's like, wait, I need to, I need to call myself. I need to like, you know, <laughs> hey, hey, Hillary, what do you think we should do? Well, Hillary, you know, and so I can really appreciate that. I can appreciate yeah. that comment about, you know, you got to, you got to, all of a sudden it gives you a chance to be you. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really does. And, and, and literally you, you learn so much about yourself, you know, that you maybe never saw or didn't know to that magnitude. And, and a lot of times, and for me, for sure, how much I really am like him. You know, I, there's so much that I do in my, my siblings and the nieces and nephews, the different grandchildren, they, they all say it, you know, you, 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 you a grandpa, you so like grandpa, <laughs> you know, and it's just little, little things that makes them think that. And, and, you know, you, you go. And you're so you go, always on time. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, know. I mean, if you're five minutes early, you're late. You guys. Right. Like, right. This guy is an on time type of guy. <laughs> and that was him. Oh, I love that. Well, you know what? I, I just, I, I would like to wrap this up with if for the people out there listening, and you having this just incredible mindset, you have the mindset of a true champion. And there's this comment about like, you know, you can have the mindset of the world class, which is that top 5%. And then the middle class, which is everyone else, that's like the 70% just, you know, you kind of go about your, your ways. But the world class mindset, that, that top 5%, what would you say you, how do you keep yourself focusing on the positives? Knowing that I haven't achieved, knowing that there's still more out there for me to achieve and accomplish. And, and my, my definition of success in so many different ways is how many others can I bring along with me on the ride and the journey? And so that it forces me to stay positive because I, I, I want, I want, I want, you know, and so mm -hmm. I, I'm never, never satisfied and never settled. And, and I think that's the, it, it, that was birthed back, yes, from my parental standpoint with them. But then as I got to college, I remember it, it helped me understand in my sophomore year why I said, I want to be, I, I want to be more than just an athlete. I don't want to be known for just being a basketball player here at Oregon State University. And we were like the number one ranked uh, school in the country uh, at previously at one, at one time. And it was all the great hoopla and all that kind of stuff that was going on. But I'm like, there's more, there's more to this. And I want this platform to be used for something more and something greater. And that still is instilled inside of me on a daily basis when I wake up that there's more. And so that's my answer. Oh, I love that. And by the way, I did not know that. I didn't know that when you were even a junior, you were thinking like, I don't want to just be an athlete. I want to do more than that. And I wish we could spend, you know, hours and hours <laughs> more talking on this because what people don't know is that you have endless businesses. I mean, there's so many things that you have your hands in right now. You're, you're helping get COVID tests to, um, you know, old yeah. age homes and, and health centers. And it's just, it's incredible. It's incredible what you, what you quietly, as you did when, you know, you were with your teammates, you're just this quiet champion. You're a presence that's just so incredible. When I'm with you, it just, you know, you, you really are an exceptional person. You really are. You're exceptional. So I can't thank you enough. One of the things that at relaunch, we, uh, talk about going through the program of relaunching mm -hmm. yourself and having this powerhouse, you become this powerhouse of possibility. What does powerhouse of possibility mean to you? You know, it, it means to me the perfect analogy of a fire hydrant, you know, that there, the opportunities are out there and the power is within and, and each, each opportunity that presents itself, it's like just one, one crank on that wrench, just unleashing mm -hmm. and releasing that, that power to come and just out there. And I'm just, watch our world. 
watch out world because this it's re, I'm totally relaunched. Watch out world. You know, <laughs> no, I'm serious. It's it's you know, you can't like I said, you can't I, I can't be satisfied. So therefore I can't rely on what, what happened yesterday or last year or a decade ago or two decades ago. You know, I'm I'm about setting and making new trends and setting new stories right now. And so that's where that that powerhouse. So I I love it. That's a great question, though. I I like that concept right there. That's, mm. that's well, awesome. Well, thank you again. Love you so much. Thank you for being on the podcast. And I just I admire and respect you so much. And you know what? We're excited to see what else you're going to be doing in this big quest to continue your relaunch. So thanks again, my friend. Thank you, Hillary. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you felt a connection to this episode of the Silver Lined Relaunch, please head over to iTunes now. It would mean so much to me if you would leave a good review and help others find Silver Linings as well. And don't forget, you can have immediate access to all of the bonuses and notes from the show today in our treasure chest which you have access to for free by texting 55444 and typing in treasure chest. Or you could go to our private Facebook group, The Relaunch Effect, Living a Life You Love. Together we've hit the reset button for you, turning your transitions into a transformation. Until next time, don't forget, there's always a silver lining.